My name is Selena, and I'm here to introduce Adrian. Uh, he is the author of J Clouds. Did we just get a woot out there in the crowd? Nice. Good job. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, he's going to talk today about cluster services with Apache War. And he also had a really great dinner for $6 that he could tell you all about if you wanted to know later here in Portland um, and really like sign inch nails. So here you go. Welcome, Adrian. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the wood. Um, <laughs> so this is going to be an interesting presentation because it's uh, followed up by Chad's presentation. Uh, so this is from DevUp like how we actually wrote this thing to do clustered services and sprinkle in were uh, with uh, Puppet. And um, Chad's gonna talk about how you'd actually use it to do something useful. So um, this is gonna show code and, and all that. And um, without further ado, we'll move to the slide called Agenda. As you might expect, we're going to talk about things. So I'm Adrian. I founded JClouds uh, two and a half years ago. It's an um, abstraction a library in, uh, in Java, but it also has uh, you know, more JVM focus. We have some folks that are using it for Clojure and Scala and stuff. And uh, also a member of the Apache Wear project I'm going to talk about. Um, my uh, day job is I'm the chief evangelist at CloudSoft. So you want to build a cluster. So um, this is a, a schematic of HBase, um, and so sometimes distributed services are kind of hard to put together because there's various roles that need to be on various machines, and they all have to like integrate together and, and hook up. So it's uh, rolling out um, data services like NoSQL type services tend to involve um, a lot of work because you have to concert multiple machines and doing multiple roles at the same time. Um, we're not going to actually launch HBase during this demo, but I'm going to launch something. And if you've ever used um, cloud servers before, you know they don't boot instantly. So right now, I'm actually going to kick off a command that I'll explain to you later about how it actually works. And so I'm going to go over here and click stuff. Um, so I'm going to launch a cluster in Rackspace UK, um, where it works on a whole bunch of things. And I'll talk about that later. Um, I'm using Rackspace UK because Chad is going to use Rackspace US and I don't want to screw up each other. And um, yeah. So that's going that. Right. So there's multiple roles and also there, you know, when you're building uh, data services, a lot of times you have to be aware of like what network do you want to communicate on versus what's your service network. So a lot of times your, um, your cluster will have you know, thrift clients or, or whatever that are more um, public facing. And then it might have communication it needs to make inside the cluster to keep its state in sync. So when you're, when you're trying to build a cluster, you need to be aware of, of the various roles, not just machines, but also what networks are around and, and, and how you can make this thing work efficiently. Um, if you think about what you have to do, first thing you need to do is, is be able to break down whatever you're doing into, into roles. Um, so for example, in HBase, there are several. Um, it is a composite of other services. So for example, HBase combines Hadoop and Zookeeper and also has some other code of its own. So it's a composition. Um, and like the four circles on the left, or eh, ellipses or whatever, are, are uh, Hadoop-based, then Zookeeper, and then on the right is just uh, HBase-specific stuff. So when you think about data services, a lot of times you're actually talking about composed services that are taking advantage of things that were already written, because most of the time um, you, you hope that they would try to reuse code. Um, next, you have to figure out what topology it makes sense for this cluster. Um, or, and so a lot of times there's, there's uh, like a master-slave type of role. Um, or your control side uh, scales differently than your data side. So it's a good idea to figure out what you're scaling um, you know, and, and what makes sense to move. Um, and so in the case of a, a data service, it's generally whatever's doing the actual storage uh, will have different scaling attributes than what's doing the control. Um, and so whatever that service is, you have to understand the topology that you'd like. So in this case, for HBase, you know, when you're scaling 
most often you're not going to add like a zookeeper every time you get a new piece of data into HBase. So uh, you're actually probably going to be growing out your task trackers, your data nodes, and the region servers. Um, then you need to figure out your workflow for actually rolling this stuff out. Um, you know, the DevOps folks obviously here have different words for various things. I'm just going to use these ones here. Um, and we could have a, a really long, useless discussion about how these words are wrong or right. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to bootstrap stuff and then you need to operate on them. Especially like a data service, it's something that needs to persist. Uh, you need to be able to uh, do things like uh, make uh, snapshots and perhaps restore, heal it. Um, so it needs to go all the way out into managed space. So looking at provisioning, uh, here we're talking about bringing machines online um, and making a, a base OS available. Um, and again, we also have to have networks. Uh, without, without networks, then there's no point. So if we're thinking about provisioning in a lot of tools, um, like for example, JClouds or Fog and Ruby, uh, there, there are ways to um, just roll out things. And then you, you could also just use straight up virtualization or just a bunch of machines you happen to have already. Um, once you have the OS there, then you need to install the software. I'm using the word install. Uh, this, this can typically be done with a um, you know, config management solution like Puppet, or you could use Shell Scripts, or you could use Chef, or whatever you want. Um, but the idea is that you need to lay down um, the things that don't change very much. So for example, um, you could have actually pre-canned images with, with like your favorite version of, of Java and your favorite distribution of HBase, and that would have been fine um, compared to like Puppet or whatever. The config phase is the interesting one um, because that's when you're actually applying the roles, the specific um, nests uh, of this specific data service. So like which ones are masters, which ones are region servers. And that's where like config files have to be rewritten. Sometimes you have to do some things like, you know, for example, open up ports on firewalls, rewrite your IP tables, stuff like that. That's where a lot of your config management solutions come in really handy. Um, and then you, because it's a distributed, distributed environment, you have to have some sort of orchestration as well. Um, once you're live, um, that's management phase, and that's you know where a lot of tools leave off. But like, how do you migrate? Um, you know, if, if you, for example, have an unhealthy machine, or or how do you repair uh, something that's already failed, or how do you scale in, scale out? Um, and, and that's that's what I mean by manage. Um, you can make this stuff, and people do make this stuff with the JClouds library. Um, and we have some components that help with it. For example, the compute does the provisioning and helps you kick off things like Puppet. Um, it also has a way to execute uh, shell scripts and, and things like that so that you can do arbitrary commands. Uh, we also have blob store, which is obviously important. If you're dealing with a data service, you might need to restore or persist its state to somewhere durable. Um, and and uh, so the combination of those two makes it really handy for creating services. Um, we also expose provider-specific APIs. So for example, on Amazon, there's a whole bunch of hooks that are very interesting, especially if you're making clusters. You might want to consider things like spot pricing, which can save you half the cost of launching your, your nodes. Or if you're in like vCloud, you might want to use a different you know, type of network bridge. Um, and um, because this is written to be embedded, um, as well as being used as standalone. Um, we, we deal with uh, a driver architecture so you can swap out libraries so it doesn't conflict with your class paths and stuff like that. Um, probably the more interesting thing for, for users is that we, we actually test it. So um, before each release, we have to do a full regression on every single cloud provider, which takes two or three days, actually, because um, you have to go like call them up, have them unlock your account, figure out which images are now broken, which ones are the ones that do work and, and all of that stuff, which is sort of crafty work, but um, you know, it helps actually make things stable. And then people who build on it are, are more stable because of that. Um, in conceptually speaking, from the provisioning standpoint, uh, we deal with two things, templates and groups. So uh, JCloud decided to uh, focus on aggregate commands as opposed to single commands. So uh, for example, you can launch a single server in JClouds, but that means you make a group of size one. Um, we focus on being able to launch large numbers of machines, and we have folks that are launching three or 400 machines at a time right now. Um, we also use uh, templates. So 
You can specify direct IDs of things you know, like your favorite AMI and your favorite location and your, all the things that you've, you've come to, to love in EC2. Um, but if you don't happen to care, um, you can try parameter lists, and it will pick the last operating system that was tested on JClouds. Um, or you can use um, you know, more semantic things. Like, for example, you can say OS family Ubuntu uh, version like greater than 10.04. Um, we normalize down to numbers. Even if you have things like Natty, we, we've decided that on an OS basis we, we focus on numbers because it's easier to compare. Um, and then you can also say like the minimum attributes you need. So for example, maybe you're, you're, you know Zookeeper needs at least 256 megs to run. So you can actually specify that as opposed to memorizing machine sizes. Uh, so where that looks is like, for example, you could create two groups of machines. And this is a simplification because HBase is more complicated than this. But say you have a master group and you have a slave group or a region server group, then you could create these two groups um, and specify the, the number of, of nodes you want and the minimum attributes you need to kick it off. And we have a command called run script, which generally uses SSH to uh, bootstrap, but it's not required to. For example, we have code in vCloud that can use the guest customization hooks in VMware to do it. We also have code that's nearly finished in like the Hermark API, which they have a, a REST API for executing commands. And I think also Delta Cloud has that. So whatever means necessary to run a script, we can figure that out. Um, and then uh, because it's a group API, you could expect everything to be run in parallel. Um, so you, you're not, it's not going like, to wait for everything to finish one at a time. Uh, then we focused on a predicate basis for doing commands, so you can create your own predicates. Uh, we have some initial work, uh, sort of an experiment package in uh, Rundeck, because Rundeck is actually a much more robust way to do things across the data center with predicates. Um, and hopefully we'll get those things aligned better uh, in the future too. But you could take whatever attributes you have about the node, and you can use that as a command. So you can say, okay, I want to run a script on these attributes, which include subnet or whatever you happen to come up with. And that, that helps the cleanliness of the design, for one, because you don't have a million methods um, to invoke. Um, and, and two, it helps with composability. So if somebody made a really handy predicate um, that, that helps define like, what it is to uh, you know, say what's healthy in this specific uh, network, you could just use that object. Um, and the, uh, the predicate logic is applied, so it's sort of like a filter. So for example, um, if you think of it like, you know, grep said everything else, like if you're doing filters and transforms, uh, we would list all of, the, all of the nodes at minimum depth. We would apply the predicate to that, and then we would fan out and then you know, perform whatever commands, whether they're reboots or running scripts, um, based on, on that filter. It, it saves on a lot of API calls, so it ends up being less chatty. Um, and here's what the code looks like in Java. Um, so if you don't like Java, you probably still won't like this. Um, <laughs> but we have folks that, are, like I said, right in, in Clojure, that's, that's our most uh, progressed language binding. Um, there are several people who have been maintaining that to the point where we actually have, have uh, uh, our second API in Clojure already. Um, we have some folks that are interested in Scala specifically. I remember we were talking about um, a couple weeks ago with the Mongo guys. Uh, that Brandon was very interested in helping out with that. And um, so it, without a language binding, obviously people are writing in their own language anyway. So you don't need, you don't need us to like write a library for that. So for example, we have folks that are using Groovy and, and even R. Um, so the idea is that you specify the minimum details. So uh, for example, if you don't care what operating system it is, you don't have to specify it. You probably do want to at least specify firewall rules because we can't guess that from you yet on GitHub. Um, so we're can build your cluster. Uh, you don't have to, you don't have to like, figure out how to um, make all these steps happen together, because this is one tool um, that already has that cooked. Um, there's another cool, also, uh, cool tool called Palette that does it on the Clojure side, which is also quite popular. And it's been used by that uh, new Twitter storm um, thing that was released. Uh, I'm going to focus on we're. Um, so we're changes the abstraction level from machines to services. And they're, they're defined by a list of roles. So um, it is still machine bound in a way, because this number, like 1 or 6, 
is how many of a specific hardware profile you have. Um, but you can actually specify multiple roles, and those roles could be, um, you know, could be puppet modules or, or manifests, or they could be uh, chef, uh, like the equivalent to like a chef run list, uh, or they could just be uh, shell scripts. So you can combine and mix and match different instructions. So this case doesn't actually show that, but um, because we're talking about Puppet here, I'll show you exactly how to weave those things together, how we decided to do that. Let's do a quick time check. Cool. So uh, Wir has a, a Java API, so you can embed this if you like. Um, it also has a, a CLI. So for, for example, right now in jclouds proper, we don't actually have a CLI. Um, you can use a REPL for using it through JRuby or Clojure, whatever. But um, we don't actually create like a main class with command line arguments and stuff. We probably will. But right now, uh, Wir does. And, and so if you wanted to, to use that, uh, you can use it. Um, so inside of Wir, basically they've focused on a few phases. Um, and so there's bootstrap and configure. Uh, they also have you know, random things like destroy, reboot. I'm not going to list you know, just regular operations. But when we say bootstrap, basically we mean to create the cluster um, and then run the command to lay down what's common, um, what, what's static. The, um, so in this case, uh, we do make a differentiation between relatively static stuff and things that change a lot. That gives us an opportunity. We don't do it right now, but it gives you the opportunity to do things like an image cache. So for example, if you were to roll out to 100 machines, it might be more sensible to bring it up to bootstrap state, snap it off as an image, and then clone 100 of them, because it would be you know, much less work for you. Um, so bootstrap is all about bringing, bringing the systems online and, and applying the, the more static configuration to them. It also does things like you know, installs an admin user, rewrites the pseudo rules, and stuff like that. So you can, you can go in. The other reason why you separate these two things out, bootstrap and configure, is quite often people screw up configure. And then if you haven't um, actually gotten yourself access to that machine yet, then it's very hard to troubleshoot. So um, it does this in two phases. And by the time Bootstrap's finished, you could just SSH straight in and troubleshoot whatever you might have screwed up in your configure phase. Um, you, can, you can imagine this is, this is focused on allowing devs to sort out problems of how you actually write a service. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why we've actually focused on this phase. But the reality is that you can't actually configure until you know the topology of your cluster. Like you need to know its IP addresses and all the other facts around it. So that's the other reason why configure is a different phase. So once, once configure is there, you actually have a map of um, each of your roles and then like what nodes and IP addresses and everything. And you can use that data to, uh, for example, the clusters that don't have auto discovery can be, you know, you can actually literally write XML files for them. Um, also it does configure, uh, it does firewall update. So whatever the firewall changes you need for this to work. Um, destroy surprisingly destroys a cluster. Um, you can make your cluster sparkle with Puppet. Um, this is the extent of my uh, graphic design expertise. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the main point is is that yeah, after you actually start up a cluster, um, yeah, you can SSH into it, but there's probably more to it. Um, you know, it's nice to to bang out clusters for testing, but you still even for testing, you might want to do things like mount extra drives or you know, set up your, your Vim profiles and stuff like that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that you probably want to do, even if it weren't a prod cluster. And if it were a prod cluster, you'd probably definitely want to do things like at least set up log rotation and, and stuff like that. So Puppet's a great way of weaving in those sorts of details. Um, and it's a good way of reusing things like, for example, the services that are predefined and, and all the integration logic, which is, which is sometimes difficult um, to, to write because it's orchestrated across multiple machine boundaries. And then actually use you know a combination of, of Puppet or whatever else you might choose to use to sparkle it up a bit. So um, what we do is we basically say that there's a there's a essentially like a role handler. So uh, Puppet colon would essentially invoke Puppet to actually um, you know call that specific thing to decorate extra details. You can imagine that other other technologies that do configuration management we would have the same approach. So if you wanted to like set up the Munin host manifest, have that run, then you would actually say puppet colon Munin colon colon host. And the things you have to do is you just have to define where we get the modules from because we can't guess right now. Um, so uh, that could be from Git in a branch 
or it could be a tar GZ you have around. Um, but you have to be able to tell us at least in configuration where we can find the modules. Um, so an example of what this looks like is you have here, for example, uh, this is a one machine that has an aggregate of stuff on it. So we have the zookeeper that essentially Patrick Hunt wrote, wrote um, that's really you know, quite reliable. Um, and it's sprinkled in with a random uh, Apache server <laughs> and NTP. So I'm going to defer to Chad for things that are actually useful and realistic to put in there. I just chose a couple things. Um, and then you, you would have to declare the extra firewall rules that you need. Um, I didn't actually have to say 2181 for Zookeeper because that's default. I'm just showing that you can comment to limit things. Um, and um, this was a design decision we made. Uh, we could potentially have some interesting orchestration handshakes between Puppet and the local OS and were to like automatically figure out what firewall rules it needs. But that would actually turn into some really complicated code for the rest of the project to maintain for years and years. So we decided for now, let's just wait until people complain about the fact that we're not auto-discovering firewall rules. And um, so if you, if you invoke Puppet and it needs something like a new firewall rule opened up, then you would specify extra rules there. Otherwise, all the, all the default services know what rules are you know, already baked in. Um, as I mentioned, you have to specify where you're actually getting your, your modules from. And you can also do like light syntax to add in extra attributes you need for the specific manifests. Um, you can also choose branches. So um, again, this stuff was, is going to be more interestingly conveyed uh, by Chad later. So do hang in for that. Um, and then if you have some things that, you, that you're just your favorite little puppet module that's not actually in Git or whatever, you can just give us a tar -GZ. Behind the scenes, pretty interesting. Um, if you specify a tar -GZ, this actually will invoke jcloud's blob store behind the scenes to reduce the chattiness between your client and the actual server rollout. So for example, it would just throw it into either you know, S3 or, or cloud files or um, Swift if you're using OpenStack or Atmos if you're using a cloud that uses EMC stuff so that you essentially shoot it off once and then, and then behind the scenes it will actually write a curl command, a signed curl command uh, for the machines to actually pull down that from the central source that's local to the cloud. Um, because this is a library um, and we don't have a server dependency uh, of any sort, um, then uh, you know, we try to use what you've got. So, if you have a Bob store someplace, we can use that to reduce the chattiness between where and, and the cluster. And so how this hooks into the, the where life cycle phases. So um, what happens is uh, on the before bootstrap stuff, um, we basically collect all of the modules. Um, so you may have speci specified in your, in your um, cluster definition that you have a manifest and then also just a module. So it would just invoke whatever the default manifest is. Um, but either way, we, fi we figure out what, what the modules are. Um, and then we look in those properties and then figure out like, what statements to give to the OS. So the OS might be a git command or the OS might be a curl command after we've staged that data. Um, then the configure, we're just doing puppet apply, essentially. We have to create the um, site PP file and, and we do puppet apply. It's, it's not very complicated. Um, and I already talked about the blob store stuff. So um, special thanks for the thing that hopefully works when I flip my screen. Uh, so um, Alex Hennevel did a lot of the coding of this uh, uh, support. And um, Garrett was really helpful in actually uh, answering questions quite quickly about you know, where we could make assumptions. Because one of the things that's really helpful if you can make a configuration syntax that um, it can be much simpler if you can get all the right assumptions about, you know, behavior of, of Puppet and everything. And then Chad actually is, is sort of like our conceptual leader for this project. So um, neither Alex or I are, are very good at Puppet. I, I attended a couple days of, or a day and a half of, of Garrett's class, so I'm like good enough to be dangerous. But um, Chad runs like Puppet for Cloudera's like you know massive set of servers, so he really helped to make sure this is all relevant. And um, I'm not sure what slide comes after this, um, so I'm going to undo that for a second. Um, 
So let's see if it actually worked. So I have massive font going on. Um, so Puppet's CLI is pretty ugly. Um, we didn't obviously pay any attention to make this beautiful. Um, you can see bootstrapping cluster and configuring template. Uh, these things are just the um, uh, phases. So for example, uh, in JClause, I mentioned that there are some minimum configuration parameters you can set uh, or none at all. And so this is where it's actually going out to the cloud and making sure that, for example, it can find, if you specified Ubuntu 10.04, it can actually find Ubuntu 10.04 on that specific cloud provider or your OpenStack Nova host. Um, so then it would, it would die violently if it weren't the case. Um, then it would just you know, analyze the topology and figure out how many nodes you have to launch. So in this case, I only had one um, node, and so it just parsed out the, the roles that were there. At some point, they will have been started. And so started just helps you to you know, know that you've got that stuff going. You can SSH into them. Then we authorize a firewall, only ingress right now. We don't do egress yet. Um, and then it would do that for each of the role sets. Um, ah, sorry. Then uh, after all that's done, uh, we run the configuration scripts, and it just tells you whatever the node ID. Again, I, I launched in Rackspace uh, UK, so they have numerical IDs as opposed to like you know, the Amazon's instance thing. Um, then after this is done, I actually called the cluster named Adrian. So um, it, it does something handy for you. Um, it writes an instances file, so you can use other languages once these things are started up. So if I take a look at this guy, um, you can see it only has one role because uh, one row because I only have one machine, um, and it gives you the, the public host name, the roles that are in there, and the IP address, uh, the private IP address. So if you do that, like for example, you can you, you can gut the hell out of it, right? So if I want to, you know, say like interact with Zookeeper there, I can you know do some netcat stuff, or you can use Ruby or or Python or whatever you want. Um, and you could also do something like a little bit more Aachen and do things like, you know, check the HTTP is actually listening for that random HTTP server I threw on the box. And um, so WIRS used in two major ways. Um, you have folks that are using it to just bang out clusters for use in other languages or just to set up something that's not in Java. We also have a bunch of folks that are using WIR as like the before hook in their CI. So um, they would want to set up like Cassandra to run all the tests that depend on Cassandra or whatever else their, their services are. And because it's written in Java, you could actually write a test ng or JUnit hook to actually do that, or, or a Jenkins plugin or whatever. And so, um, so basically, what's, I think probably the HTTP server didn't actually open. Um, so, for example, this is used, like Twitter do a lot of work for uh, Cassandra, so one of the reasons why we have um, uh, something called BYON working in JClause is because they wanted to have WIR work on machines that are already out there as opposed to waiting for cloud nodes to start up. So we have this syntax, um, uh, a YAML format that we use to define machines. And with that, you can actually say, you know, just the SSH keys or whatever else like that that you need there, as opposed to actually using a, um, uh, a, a real cloud provider. So I'm just going to nuke the cluster now. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, so if I wanted to, like, troubleshoot why this uh, web server didn't actually come up, I could SSH into this. Because by default, we're, we'll actually look at your current user and then set up set up SSH keys and set up the wheel group and all that other stuff so that things just work. Um, so I could, you know, sudo and, and do things like my favorite command. Um, but uh, so it's, it's, it's trying to make things pretty handy. Obviously, if you were running a real cluster, um, you would probably do things with your puppet like constrain that. You know, you, you could actually just wipe out the default settings that Word does or, or you choose not to do it in the first place. And um, so I think that's probably it on, on the demo side because launching clusters is really takes forever. I'm just going to shut it down. One second. Oh, and I'm using this word recipe here. So 
recipe, they're using it broadly uh, in Whir. So we just have a bunch of properties files that happen to have stuff that people tend to ask for. Like how do you start up Hadoop at using spot pricing on EC2, or how do you use it in Rackspace to start up Zookeeper? Um, so we try to keep, you know, sort of that stuff together. So if you wanted to like sprinkle in ganglia with your stuff, and um, right now there's a lot of services in Whir, um, and there's more coming like all the time. So if uh, where am I? If you just you know blah command or something like that, it will tell you. Oh man, my resolution is really bad for this. So. Uh, it would tell you all the sy syntax, including um, th things that you would want to do. Uh, so there's there's all sorts of like little tweaking parameters you can do, and in in Word itself. Um, so for example, these are the ones that are built in right now. Um, I know we have Mongo in progress. We have some other things going on too. So if your favorite cluster service isn't there, um, then by all means uh, raise up a Jira. And it's powered by JClouds on the back. So if you have something that's not supported in JClouds, there's two ways of doing it. One is to put in an issue in JClouds to support it. Two is to use the BYON, bring your own node, and then just write a YAML file, and we can then use it. So it's a nice bridge. In fact, we're using that while we're developing VirtualBox for JClouds. So for example, our test cases that take ISO files and then do all the weird um, virtual box mumbo jumbo to get it to work. Uh, we actually use um, BYON on our, on, our, on our own machine to actually do SSH commands and, and stuff like that. So, and it is somewhat arbitrary, but the reason why we do that is, especially inside of Java, um, how you execute commands is really ugly. You have to do like process.get runtime, all this stuff, lots of static method, yuck. So, if you want to test your code, um, you know, and you're using like old school Java stuff that isn't written very well, then you're sometimes better off making your own abstraction and, and then just testing that. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it off to questions after I just mention a couple things in progress. And if you want me to talk about code, I can bring, bring it up. So obviously, we're doing more services. Uh, VBox is almost done. Uh, and this will basically have a supplier model. So you'll be able to say, um, give us an ISO URL. And we'll suck it down and make a um, you know a base VBox um, image or like machine rather out of it, and then configure the system to use it. Um, that will also be embeddable. So um, that's one thing that's kind of hard to do if you don't is actually get this get VBox specifically to work without shelling out and doing a lot of VBox managed commands. Um, the other thing that we're doing, uh, obviously, we have um, this started as Puppet Master. So currently, this is using masterless approach. Um, but we already have a puppet, a puppet master service. So one thing that would be very interesting is to try and do like an inversion. So um, if you happen to um, have a puppet master applied in your cluster, detect that and then stop asking for certain things and just make correct decisions as, as possible to actually configure it to use uh, puppet master as opposed to like doing puppet apply. Um, there's some work already in Ajira for uh, Chef Solo. Um, and uh, then the bigger thing, though, is about healing and resizing. That's really difficult uh, if you guys have tried. Um, main thing is, is that if you don't have um, very tight configuration management, it's very hard to get um, a, a cluster to have the correct state when something has shifted. So uh, we're looking into that. And that would basically do things like uh, repair a failed node um, and potentially start working into active state management where you actually have a WER service deployed by WER to actually keep the, the shape of the cluster relevant. So that's sort of um, you know, back to the future stuff for now because it's not very far along. OK, now uh, question time. Got about seven minutes. How this being practical to expand uh, from a cloud solution into a real hardware solution as well. So in order to be able to use WIR to maintain both your 
hardware platform and your cloud platform in indi indistinguishably. So the question is, like, how could we work in hybrid environments? And so right now, um, the machine templates, um, I think that what we would have to do essentially is, is you know how we did a uh, puppet prefix to actually define the, you know, a role that has a specific handler? What we probably have to do is dance around the, our template concept to say that you could have multiple um, cloud providers and one of them might be in, uh, pointed to a vCloud API or, or a bunch of machines where another one is actually pointed to, to EC2 or Rackspace or whatever. And so that's, that's on the provisioning side. Um, there's obviously strong implications on the configuration side about making smart decisions about networking and stuff when you're actually crossing those. Um, but the easy part is enhancing it to have um, multiple cloud providers in the same cluster. The hard part would be making reasonable decisions. <laughs> and, and I don't think either of those are on, I mean, certainly the first one's easy. The, the second one's is, you know, hard in a way that's probably not quite as hard as, as, as healing. Um, but I think that's, that's doable. Other questions? The, the firewall things you mentioned, is that just the firewalls inside the instance, or do you also like modify security groups? So the fire, firewalls and how do we handle it? So currently it's, it's somewhat naive because it's only using clouds that support firewalls right now and not actually writing things like IP tables rules when that, that doesn't exist. Um, so for example, this direct, directly translates into security group commands. Um, what, what's probably, you know, if we looked at this in anger, what we probably end up doing is try to analyze if we have a firewall in our list of roles on any machine um, because you could conceivably create a firewall appliance and specifically try and, and block your routes to actually go to that. Um, that would be like at, at this end of complexity. <laughs> on this end of complexity, there's already like a JIRA to fall back to rewriting IP tables if there's no uh, firewall available for a specific cloud provider. Um, and then um, if, if you think about private cloud, um, then you probably want another way. Um, because for example, you know, if, if you're running private cloud, you probably have your own firewall that might just be a physical appliance someplace. So we would probably need an adapter similar to like the puppety thing to, to have a firewall handler um, that you could you know, hook up to whatever your favorite appliance API is. But for now, the code is limited to actually just writing, um, writing security groups. So the, a nice way to deal with this currently is to use like Puppet's module for IP tables and then just use that in, instead for now. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks.